Good afternoon, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today at a very odd hour, just after lunch. It's very difficult, I think the most difficult uh, slot to, uh, <laughs> to help people stay awake. Please feel free to go to sleep if you want to, 40 minutes. <laughs> so I am uh, Shangamitra Bandhupadhyay. The name to my French colleagues, I'm sure, is very difficult. It has 18 characters. We just exchanged notes with Ushar Vijay Raghavan. <laughs> uh, I'm going to speak on uh, what I do, and I am my group. We do in uh, Indian Statistical Institute. There are a few other groups working in computational biology, bioinformatics. So this title in particular, again, is, um, is a suggestion from Usha to uh, capture what I'm going to, just the overview of certain research results which have come out of, uh, the, of the lab. Uh, so it'll capture, it captures in general uh, what I'm going to discuss today. We do a lot more than what I have time to discuss. I will uh, naturally not go into the details of any of the methods. Uh, I am a computer scientist. Let me be very, very clear on that. I'm a computer scientist and uh, doing some amount of biology, computational biology. But what we do is we develop the algorithms. That is what uh, we take pleasure in developing algorithms which will beat the algorithms which are in existence, which, will, which are the state of the art. So we try to do better than what is there. So quickly, uh, because we are in this women in science seminar, so uh, some of my thoughts, uh, two, just two slides on this. Why do we need women in science? Uh, do we really need? Uh, well, we need it for the sake of science and for the sake of the society. Not, not only for the women, uh, certainly for the women, of course, uh, they should have this encouragement, but it is for the science, for sake of science that we need it. And it would be nice if we can put an economic value to having women there because nobody will just give alms, right? Um, uh, we cannot just uh, beg for, uh, for uh, benefits, okay? So if, we can, if, it is, if it is established that it, has, it makes economic sense, in having women in science, only then will everybody, uh, irrespective of men and women, because if it is good for the men to have women in science, well, everybody will want. So uh, we have to make that very clear, that it makes economic sense, money, in terms of money, pure and simple money, it makes sense to have women in science. Uh, because nature has not, um, has not been partial in uh, giving you know, this, in, when, when, when it was distributing excellence, uh, it was not partial to men. So there are excellent women, and that uh, energy has to be tapped for the sake of science, for the sake of humanity. Uh, I'm not sure about these numbers. I quickly gathered them from uh, very usual sources. So um, you see, in Asia, the women earning PhDs in uh, science, technology, and, uh, engineering, and medicine, that's very low. Uh, mathematics is very low, uh, and this this is a result from a French study, uh, which shows that uh, in fact the percentage has gone down slightly, but percentages would be uh, I mean we also need to look at numbers as somebody said these are anyway very small numbers when when we are talking of women, then at, uh, from one to two if one woman had got an award till a particular point of time and then it becomes two it's a hundred percent increase, huh, which means nothing. So uh, we have to be very cautious when we do these statistics because these are small numbers and small sample size is very dangerous to draw conclusions from such numbers. Uh, percentages, as has been pointed out in multiple uh, presentations today morning, go down when moving into senior positions, still less when moving into decision-making positions. In general, women and men in comparable positions, women are older and in particular in engineering, mathematics, physics, we've heard uh, in the morning, grossly underrepresented, okay? So, what has been my experience? I am on the wrong side of all these numbers. So, um, I have earned degrees in physics, computer science, and engineering, PhD in computer science, joined as a lecturer, moved up to a professor reasonably fast, and now I'm the director responsible mo for most of the decision making in the institute, and this institute, I'll come to it very quickly in the next few slides. Uh, and also, also having a family, still managing to have, <laughs> hang on to one, including a teenage uh, son. 
So uh, this, is, this is a very difficult age. I mean, I can vouch for that. It's a very difficult <laughs> age for any child. And I have one, 18-year-old, uh, uh, and it's a, it's a terror. So what did it take? For me, at least, what did it take? Well, sincerity, commitment, just like anybody else. And to some extent, I won't say to a large extent, but to some extent, a no compromising attitude. Okay? Compromises have to be made, we all know. We have to, be, uh, we have to make compromises. Not only, men, uh, not only women, men also have to make compromises. So, uh, but maybe for women, a little more, but not to a large extent. To some extent, a non-compromising attitude does get the results. That has been my experience. If on certain matters, not on every matter. If I start fighting, if women start fighting on every matter, then the value of the fight goes down. But if on very, very critical matters, we do put our foot down, I have put my foot down, and the family then falls in line. So, uh, because the family also values the woman as much as the woman values the family. So, uh, both ways it happens. So, if you really uh, feel strongly about certain things and uh, we put our foot down, then very often than not, the family will fall in line. So, and an acceptance that a price has to be paid. I cannot have it uh, the best of all worlds. So, a price has to be paid. Um, there is, uh, you know, a goddess in, uh, in Hindu uh, religion, a goddess called Durga, who has ten hands. And uh, so, therefore, with ten hands, one is expected to do a lot more than you can do with two hands. And uh, after some of these prizes, uh, the reporters usually come and uh, being a woman ha attracts a lot more attention than a man getting the same prize. So reporters have come to me and said that uh, you must be like a Durga, huh? taking care of family, taking care of work, uh, attaining great heights, and so on and so forth. So I was very clear that nobody can be a Durga. If you, do, if you give more time here, you have to uh, steal away time from somewhere else. You cannot do everything to the best extent. Uh, I mean, so a person who looks after the family does it to the best of his or her ability. But a person who is committed to work has to cut down on the family time. It is not possible for a, a woman to be a person with ten hands. So I have been committed to my work. I have that my work comes as first priority to me, and for that I have sacrificed family. Uh, Maybe if I, my family suffered, my son suffered, maybe. But I personally, I don't feel guilty because I did what I liked to do the best. I spent a lot of time in my laboratories with my students. Sometimes my son complained that you don't give me enough time. But then that is how I am. How can I help it? So not feeling guilty is also, I think, uh, important because if you carry that load of guilt all the time, then you can do justice to nothing. So. Uh, so acceptance that a price has to be paid. Maybe if I was someone else, my family would have been better. But that is, so be it. What can I do? So uh, that has been my experience. But maybe I have been lucky because I still have a family, including a son who's not, he's doing OK. <laughs> so uh, it did not take me, for me at least, too much for me than what it takes for a man. That much I should accept. That it's not that I fought, fought, fought all the time. Things came to me naturally. But as I said, maybe I was fortunate. So because I had great support from my parents, I had a husband who stayed on despite all my idiosyncrasies, and a son who accepted my abs absences. So maybe I was fortunate. I have all these things, and I also have my work. Uh, the change, I feel, has to start from the birth of a child, not just the girl child, girl child, as well as a boy. So uh, change has to start from birth to protect that child from social conditioning because that mindset gets created in the first four or five years, maybe in the first four or five years of school also. So if you look at the toys and the books, there are very stereotyped even pictures. Hmm? Uh, if it's uh, somebody driving the car in the, in the child's book, it will be a man driving the car. Somebody cooking, it will be a woman who is cooking. No wrong, nothing, I don't see any problem with that per se. But the point is, a person should be able to do whatever that person likes to do, rather than just having stereotypes. I don't like cooking, for example. I would rather somebody cook for me, and I can only <laughs> like to eat, <laughs> which is very evident, I'm sure. But anyhow, so there was an interesting um, experiment which uh, 
I heard in one of the uh, women uh, panel discussions, women-oriented panel discussion in uh, Indian International Statistical Association meeting. So there was small children, and when they are very small, you can hardly make out, uh, I mean, uh, between, you can not differentiate between a girl and a boy. So the boys, all the small children, the boys were dressed as girls, and the girls were dressed as boys. And the adults were asked to give them toys. And uh, the experiment showed that the adults had a natural tendency to give a girl, who was dressed as a girl, but as, is actually a boy, uh, dolls, and other, uh, you know, other games or um, uh, this uh, car, so something like that, those toys to the children dressed as boys. So this bias is there, and naturally those children were not accepting those toys because they were not actually used to those toys. So uh, starting from to toys to books, stereotypes, when we think of a nurse, it's always a woman. When we think of, think of a doctor, it is always a man. It is very usual. So these stereotypes have to be broken and broken right from childhood, okay? And career also, career options. I think there are, uh, now the number of role models uh, are in, number is increasing. There are a lot many role models. Not only you don't have to be a, a very successful person uh, in the usual sense to be a role model. I see role models even in very very ordinary uh, settings. Okay, so in India we have a lot of people who come in to help. Uh, in daily activities like cooking or cleaning or so that's very usual in India to have help in the house uh, there are role models there also there are many families which depend on the woman's earning uh, so there are role models and those women are also uh, like struggling to make both ends meet but they don't give up that those are also role models there are many role models now locally globally everywhere so I think Things will change. We have to. We cannot be complacent in the sense that okay, things are changing, but uh, we have to be at it all the time. Uh, but it has to change at at a at a more uh, senior level. It's very difficult to change uh, the mindset. It has to change right from the beginning, and of course at the higher levels um, in the government policies, these have to be much well thought through. With that, let me come to my institute. Uh, Indian Statistical Institute. Uh, you, this person, Mahalanobis, you might have, uh, you might be aware of Mahalanobis distance, uh, something for which he is very well known uh, around the world. Mahalanobis distance, uh, but he's also very uh, well known or has contributed a lot in large-scale sample surveys, flood research, and many things. He has been the architect of the second five-year plan of India, and in December 1931. He started Indian Statistical Institute. This is the building, one of the buildings in the current campus. Um, it was a small lab in another college in central part of Calcutta called Presidency College. He started it as a uh, small laboratory there. Uh, but by training, Mohananobis was a physicist. He studied uh, physics and he taught physics in Presidency College till his superannuation, but he be became a statistician by choice. Uh, and where we stand in India, uh, we have the headquarters here, Kolkata. And besides that, we have presence in uh, several other cities. Delhi, we have a center. In Chennai, we have a center. Uh, we have a center in Bangalore. And uh, some smaller centers in other places, including in the Northeast. This is in Tezpur in Assam. We have uh, uh, the fifth center of ISI. So with that, very brief introduction to uh, my institute. Let me come to what uh, the, the scientific work that we do, uh, that my uh, lab has been doing for the last uh, decade or so, the bioinformatics research at the Indian Statistical Institute. So very quickly, just before beginning, one or two slides, uh, just to put things in its proper perspective. So we have, this is a typical eukaryotic cell. We have the cell, inside the cell there is a nucleus, inside the nucleus there's the genetic material, which is the DNA, and if you look at it in detail, it's double-stranded uh, with each strand uh, made up of four characters, A, T, C, and G. These are, of course, molecules with all the atoms th uh, there, but uh, you can represent, it, represent uh, it with A, T, C, and G, and that's what contains uh, all the genetic information uh, 
uh, of ours or of any organisms. And this DNA, so it can be considered, as I said, uh, this is just a part of the DNA. Let's say it's a part which is the gene because the DNA will have the genes and many other things. So this is the gene which through a process of transcription makes the messenger RNA, messenger carrying the message for the corresponding protein. So messenger RNA will have uh, almost the same sequence except that T's will be replaced by U's. So we have A, U, C, G appearing in the RNA. And through another uh, transformation which is called translation, we get the protein which is a sequence of amino acids. So let's keep it uh, up to this level, no more. So DNA is a string of ATCGs, RNA is a string of AUCGs and protein is again a string of amino acids and there are typically 20 standard amino acids. Okay. So now um, you see uh, we are already looking at data. So we have the strings, the entire genomes, the transcriptome, that is the RNA which is there, the proteins, these are all strings, these are all sequences. So once we have a very little, a very, a very basic idea of the biological perspective, uh, we can afford to forget what is there at the background, but we are looking at it as sequences and then trying to analyze these sequences. We have expression data. What is expression data? It is like the amount of uh, material that, is, that a gene produces, okay? So ex the expression of the gene. And the expression of a gene does not remain constant over time or over different conditions, but it varies. So it can be thought of as, let's say, a time series, okay? Just like a stock market, uh, the prices go up and down, up and down. Similarly, the expression of a gene will go up and down. And in humans, typically there are, uh, there's uh, an order of 30,000 genes. So expression data is just like time series data. We have structures because all the sequences are important. But finally, it is the structure which uh, determines the functionality of a molecule. And therefore, it is important to know the structure. And it is very difficult to know the structure. Uh, there are ways of knowing the structure, but if you look at the number of sequences which are known and the number of structures which are known, there is a difference, a lar large difference over there. Therefore, it is an important computational task over here is to predict the structure of a molecule given its sequence. So these are important computational works. I even in sequences, uh, it may be important to, if you have sequences from a number of organisms, you may want to find out which is similar to which, to what extent, uh, in order to, let's say, uh, in order to build the evolutionary tree. So how do you compare sequences? Sequences, one way of comparing sequences is to do, align the sequences and find out how much of it uh, matches. Okay? So sequence alignment is an important problem there. Sequence to structure prediction is an important problem. Expression, as I said, like a time series, what are the genes which have similar expression patterns or which uh, the expression pattern of that gene varies similarly? That gives us some information about the gene. So uh, let's say looking at the expression and trying to infer, trying to classify uh, whether this gene is an important player in a particular uh, biological process or a particular disease, for example, trying to identify that which gene may be responsible. So here there are clustering and classification algorithms which become important in analyzing expression data. Then we have interaction networks, interactions of various types. Uh, for example, there is this gene regulatory network. If you take, if you look at the genome, genome means the entire stretch, okay, all the genes taken together plus the other things. So uh, if you look at the genome from different cells of the body, the genome will be exactly the same. But the expression different, but the cells behave differently, right? So why do the cells behave differently? Because there are mechanisms for turning on and turning off of the genes. And uh, there are other genes which control genes uh, to turn them on or turn them off. So there is a gene to gene interaction, okay? So these interactions are typically captured as gene regulatory networks. There's DNA protein interaction. So pr there are proteins which act like switches, okay? And if you recall that first slide, the central dogma, proteins are coming from genes, okay? So 
there are proteins which turn on or turn off certain genes. There are uh, proteins which behave like switches. These are called transcription factors. They will, they will uh, turn on certain genes. If they are not there, then the, genes the gene will remain silent. So uh, you see there's a DNA and there's a protein which is coming and interacting. So there is DNA to protein interaction. Uh, gene regulatory network, protein-protein interaction. Proteins don't work in isolation. They work by interacting with other partners. So protein-protein interactions, there are drug disease interactions, drug-drug interactions. So you can think of um, many levels of interactions or uh, interaction networks. And once you look at these interaction networks, or any one of them, uh, once you've drawn that interaction network, then you can forget the biology part, then it becomes a graph either a directed graph or an undirected graph. And now you can do analysis based on graph theoretic measures, uh, graph, graph theoretic methods. So uh, you can see, I mean, there are, uh, there's so much of data and so much to learn from that data that, and you can immediately see there are computational problems everywhere. So you can define computational problems, either it's clustering problem, classification problem. So these are all coming from pattern recognition literature. Uh, finding out uh, or identifying genes which are important for a particular disease, which are playing important roles. This, in the pattern recognition um, uh, terminology, you will say feature selection. So you have, for a particular problem, a number of features, but not all features are important. Then how do you identify the important features, uh, important for that particular problem which you want to solve. And so that's the typical problem of feature selection. So computational biology has become important because there's this large amount of data now, uh, important uh, to analyze those data sets in a very uh, nice way so that it gives better biological insights to help the biologists in, their, in whatever they're doing. Anyway, I mean, it's a difficult world. So uh, what I typically say is that the biologists are anyway looking at looking for a needle in a haystack through these computational methods. The size of the haystack can be reduced quite a bit, okay, by uh, eliminating uh, experiments which are most likely to end in failures. So, uh, analysis, prediction, and modeling of biological data with the help of computational methods—that is what we have been doing for the past several years. And why do we need it in biology? Because there's a huge raw and unstructured data. And uh, in order to also eliminate a lot of expensive biological experiments. Challenges, because biological system is extremely complex. It is more than a combination of its parts. It is continuously changing through evolution. Uh, but time will be the best judge how uh, it progresses. But they, already there are many, many success stories. So. <clears throat> The first, uh, first thing that we were looking at is about the sequences. So uh, there are different ways of sequencing the genome. This is the very traditional way, Sanger sequencing. Then came the next-gen sequencing uh, where uh, it was low cost. This was very high cost. This low cost, less time, massively parallel, and it generates millions of sh very, very short, short reads. In fact, it, it, when the Human Genome Project started, it was a 13-year-long project, and the task was to find out the entire genome, what is that ATCG combination, etc. One important uh, algorithm used over there was the shotgun sequencing. And what, 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 what was it? Um, the DNA ha has to be cut into smaller pieces because the technology for sequencing could only take those smaller pieces, let's say of the order of 1,000 uh, long strings, of the order of 1,000 long strings. So. Uh, now suppose you are, it's, the problem is like this, you are given a book, which is in a language you don't understand, and this book is cut into pieces, okay? So you are given all these smaller pieces and you are asked to rebuild the book. It is impossible, right? So that was the problem. Uh, how to solve this problem? Well, then it turned out that if you have only a single, so the, this problem was the same because this is an entire long stretch, you cut it into smaller pieces, sequence individual pieces, but then by that time you've lost the ordering. So how to rebuild that ordering of the smaller pieces? That was the problem. And it, was, it, it became apparent that it is not possible if you have just a single copy of that string and cut it into small pieces, it is impossible to rebuild that string computationally. What can be done is if you have multiple copies of that string, cut each in, each in whatever shorter pieces you want to, and then 
then you have a way of solving, solving this problem because then you start aligning and you have a way. I mean, uh, it is a little, um, little uh, involved, but then once you start aligning, then these pieces, uh, you can rejoin them in a way that the original string can be reconstructed with some errors, of course, but it can be to a large extent reconstructed. So that, that was a computational step, a mathematical step, and that without that it would not be possible to know the entire genome. Now with next-gen sequencing, the read lengths became much, much smaller. It had its own computational problems. There was a new set of algorithms which were developed to, uh, to, uh, to handle such smaller reads. Now again, it's going to larger reads, okay? Not small anymore. This was like 400, 500 uh, length or maybe smaller. But now again, it's growing larger. You can sequence larger ones with newer technology, but it has its own problems, lo longer reads, but very noisy. There's a lot of noise. How to do uh, alignments in presence of such noise? And you can see it's become quite 20,000 long on an average uh, that you can sequence at the same time. So we have been looking at uh, sequence alignment for some years now. In fact, one of the first things that we did was <coughs> in 2013, uh, there is uh, an algorithm called the Needleman-Wunsch algorithm, which is based on dynamic programming. And uh, it can align two strings optimally in a, at, the, at the global level. So optimal in the global sense. We came up with this algorithm, which was almost 70 to 90% faster than Needleman-Wunsch, uh, which after a certain length of the sequences, it became impossible to apply this. So therefore, people actually moved to local alignments. But with this method, it was possible to do uh, much faster. Thereafter, we did some improvements on that. And right now, we are doing work here. We, have a, we are uh, using something called locality. In fact, Foxi itself used it, locality-sensitive hashing. Hashing is one technique, very popular technique. So we are using something called locality-sensitive hashing along with the context because, you see, when you have noise, then how to handle noise is you look at the neighbors also. Uh, that will give you more information rather than looking at individual pieces which have a high degree of noise. So we are working on this, and uh, it is something that we are going to uh, come up with very soon. So this is at the sequence alignment level. We've been doing some contribution. Now, uh, we have also been doing a lot of work in something called microRNAs. So what are microRNAs? You see, if you remember again, that's uh, one slide of uh, central dogma that I showed. Uh, this is a typical protein coding gene. It is a gene which creates, uh, helps in the creation of this messenger RNA. The messenger RNA moves out of the, this is the uh, membrane of the nucleus. So it comes into the cytoplasm. And then Normally, had it not been there, this portion not been there, then it would have normally, let's say, made a protein, okay? But then what happens is this microRNA gene, the word micro means it's actually very small. It's of the order of 20 to 22 characters, 20, uh, character long, okay? Uh, uh, so microRNA gene, its task is when this microRNA appears, it goes and interacts with this mRNA Either it degrades this mRNA or sits along with it so that the translation of this me messenger RNA to the protein is repressed. So it interferes at the post-translational level, post-transcriptional level. Uh, it affects uh, the protein formation. So this microRNA gene, microRNAs, um, because they are small, they eluded uh, recognition, detection for a long time. It was only uh, in the early 2000 that it was detected that this microRNA gene, they are doing something very important there. And right now, it has been established that microRNAs play very, very major roles in almost all diseases. So the levels of microRNAs go up and down, up and up or, or down uh, in most of the diseases and in almost all types of cancer. So we've been studying this uh, molecule computationally for a long time now. And uh, we did a study where we were looking at the different cancer types and the microRNAs involved there. That was some time uh, earlier that we published this result, um, which uh, showed that there were certain microRNAs in particular which 
look to be heavily uh, involved in many, many different types of cancer. This sort of network actually gave us some biological insights that certain microRNAs could be easy, uh, or easy, not easy, but could be potential targets for drugs, okay, for, for therapeutic purposes. So uh, this was a network which we did, but another interesting work which we were doing is, as I said, uh, if you look at here, microRNA, they are targeting messenger RNAs. And messenger RNAs happen to be producing proteins. I mean, they would have produced their proteins, but because of this interaction, this protein production gets stopped. So one way in which microRNAs, they affect cancer is that uh, there are many, uh, many proteins which are responsible for cell killing. Okay, they are called apoptosis. Uh, cell killing is called apoptosis. And that is very much required because cells are forming, uh, they are created, and unless you kill also cells, there'll be just an explosion of cells in a particular region, which is nothing but cancer. So cell killing is also important, and these apoptotic proteins, they do this task. <coughs> now, what happens is if some microRNA goes and targets an apoptotic protein uh, or the messenger RNA of the protein, then uh, that protein does not get produced and if that protein is not produced, <coughs> then what happens is the cells don't get killed. Again, if the cells don't get killed but they are produced because of cell division, then what is resulting is cancer. So microRNAs are interacting with mRNAs. Certain uh, interactions are known to be real targets and certain interactions, they are non-targets. Now, as soon as you have this data, you can see if you look at it from a computational point of view now, it becomes a classification problem. You want to classify, given a microRNA and <coughs> mRNA pair, yeah, uh, <coughs> whether, <coughs> what has happened to my voice? I don't know. <coughs> so, Five minutes, okay. So uh, you can see immediately it is a classification problem. Huh? So uh, given a pair, you have to learn from these known examples and <coughs> for an unknown pair, you have to predict. So we did an interesting machine learning based work here uh, where we came up with, uh, f firstly w the challenge that we faced was that you see when it, when it is actually targeting, then the biologists report that result because that's a successful experiment. But when it was not targeting, then the biologist does not report that result and therefore it was very difficult for us to get the negative data for training the classifier, okay? And that is where our main contribution was, how to come up with a biologically plausible set of uh, negative data. Other people were solving it in very artificial ways where the training performance, the performance of the method during training on the training data was fantastic, but when it was came to the when it when it came to the case of test data, that's unknown data, then it was failing. So the, our contribution mainly was to come up with the negative data, and then we used some standard uh, standard classifier, the support vector machine classifier. We did do our own feature selection though, but what we got was very interesting results. It was we actually. Uh, compared with many, many existing methods. And you can see here, this quadrant has uh, something with a, a method with a fa low false positive rate and a high true positive rate. And our method was appearing here along with another method, an existing method. But the others were either uh, very high false positive with very low true positive, it's, uh, I mean, sorry, very high true positive with very high false positive as well, or very conservative, not saying anything, okay? So, uh, so either way, these are not good regions to be in. This is a good region to be in, and our method was performing really well there, and the, we identified that the real uh, goodness of the method stemmed from having the negative data properly selected. Uh, we also did a study of this transcription factor, microRNA, and gene regulatory network. So again, as I said, once you have the network, you can forget and, uh, about the biology, and then you can look at, look at it just like a graph. So we did an analysis of this graph for breast cancer specific network. This, and then we did with some, some computational method here called the BFS level method. 
And very interestingly, we found that certain molecules were coming up on the top level of that hierarchy. Okay? These had all transcription factors as well as microRNAs. And in this particular breast cancer specific network, these were all five microRNAs, which uh, out of those five, these three, they had, um, uh, they had enough evidence from the literature that uh, these are indeed onco-MIRs, but for two, we did not have much of, an, uh, much of evidence. Were these important? That is the question which naturally comes. Some, uh, one of them was later validated independently and very recently I've seen that this has also been validated to be playing important roles in uh, breast cancer. We did a similar study for colorectal cancer. Here in the top level, not all microRNAs, but two transcription factors and three microRNAs, of which uh, the two transcription factors were known to be uh, important in uh, cancer, but these two microRNAs were known. The third one, not much information available in the literature, so that raises a question whether this is important or not. So these are the important biological insights which we can get from computational methods. We also did one work in drug discovery. I will just go very quickly uh, over it because I don't have time. But we were drug discovery, if you think a little bit um, in detail, it is essentially an optimization problem. Okay? And we were using something called genetic algorithm, a multi-objective version of genetic algorithm uh, where <clears throat> you have multiple objectives. You don't combine them into one, but you keep them separate and try to simulti simultaneously optimize all these objectives. What you are actually doing is coming up with a Pareto-optimal surface. Uh, we did this. We were uh, looking at different uh, optimizing optimization components, uh, energy being one of them, very important, Tanimoto coefficient, oral bioavailability. This is very interesting that, okay, you have a very good molecule. You say it's a nice drug, okay, but it's a heavy molecule. In that case, it will not be absorbed by the by the cell, so it is of no use as a drug. So other measures like that is inbuilt here. And we were targeting a protein of the HIV virus, HIV-1 virus called NEF protein. And what we got is some known inhibitors were reconstructed. This gave us confidence on the method. Okay? And then we had several novel inhibitors which were the interesting parts? Because the first one, these were all known, nothing new about that, but it gave us confidence that the me method probably is doing good. So it's, it's important to look at these molecules. So uh, with that, I will uh, just stop. We have some recent uh, related publications here, um, but um, uh, I will stop with that. And thank you all for your patience after lunch. If you have any comments, any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sandalika, for the two or three the computational force with which we can, uh, the lens through which we can understand biology a lot better. Um, if there are questions, of course. in uh, material science. Uh, one reason, of course, the data set is much smaller in case of materials problem compared to biology. But as a computer scientist, do you see any kind of fundamental difference between the two? Uh, it might be easier in material science, uh, application of machine learning. Uh, <clears throat> But it has not met with so much success well, uh, as in um, biology. It has, actually. Uh, yes, uh, in the sense that biology, uh, now everybody is talking of uh, machine learning in biology. But there are people, uh, uh, at least in my own institute, we have a collaboration with Tata Steel, where uh, they're looking at the properties of steel. And again, it's an optimization problem. That's right. So uh, you have to, but people are using these techniques. That is, uh, many, many times, these techniques are hidden somewhere. You use a software, and that software is actually using, let's say, genetic algorithm, um, but nobody knows. Because it's, a, it's like a black box, it's being used like a black box, and results are coming out. Neural networks are used heavily. Mm -hmm. At least I know in physics in many areas, yeah. neural networks are used heavily. So the, G, so the amount of data explosion which is going to happen in life sciences of even you know, unculturable <coughs> soil, plant, microbe, 
human, that is going to actually require a lot more computational tools. And I think tools that Sangamitra is Because nowadays, about. storage is not an issue at all. Yeah. No, uh, so people are just. Data still, I understand what they want to do is yeah. to optimize uh, so that the production is better. Uh, not only production, but the strength of the steel, etc. Yes, exactly. These are optimized. These are optimized. But for example, application of machine learning for prediction of new material, that actually has not really come along. So that's probably. Probably that's an area which is open. Yeah. I don't know the literature over there. Sure. There was yeah, some I'm hands up. I'm going yeah. to comment on her uh, statement that it was used, it's used with in other areas without even knowing. making too, not even knowing, but I mean, for example, in particle physics and astrophysics, astronomy, and the data ana analysis have used new neural networks now, God knows, God knows decades. Yeah. It was just that it was there and that was the only thing that you could do. In other areas, the applications have exploded now. Yeah. This yeah. is how I see it. Right. Because high energy physics is using all the artificial intelligence methods yes. in astronomy and astrophysics. Because they are the dealing with huge data all the time. Uh, so nice talk. Uh, just I have one comment uh, or a question that when you develop these algorithms and you apply them in um, so so the field of statistical <laughs> genetics, let's say, uh, do you so whenever we do experiments, right? Uh, be it a material science experiment, be it an astrophysical observation, or a a biology experiment, there are errors. You know, there are errors in the measurement. There could be systematic errors, let's say, systematic errors. Do How do this computer science algorithm take care of if there are biases and systematic errors in the experiments itself? Okay. Yes, uh, that it is possible. I mean, there are methods by which you can detect that and remove that if necessary. Also, the results, uh, when, we, when we report the results, uh, there are ways of you know, uh, computing their significance, the statistical significance. So that gives you an idea that uh, so systematic biases is one thing. And this is another, uh, as I said, there are ways of uh, detecting and correcting those errors. But also, uh, on the other side, uh, there are ways of uh, uh, attaching statistical significance values to the results just to show that they are not just by chance, but uh, there is a certain way. So, that, that so I think uh, we are running out of time. We can take it. Um, we, have a, we have a tea break. We have a tea session yeah. of uh, casual interactions, and we can actually. We can take it there. <laughs>